Africa, Professor Emmanuel Falk. I'm honored that Professor Falk agreed to speak at our conference. Professor Falk, as I am sure you all know, is a very renowned philosopher and theologian from the Catholic University of Paris. He specializes in patristic and medieval philosophy, phenomenology, and the philosophy of religion. And you will know him best from his philosophical uh, trilogy, the Tridium Philosophique, uh, the three volumes of which are all translated into English, namely The Metamorphosis of Finitude, The Wedding Feast of the Lamb, and The Guide to Gethsemane. Also translated into English, we have Crossing the Rubicon, the Borderlands of Philosophy and Theology. But Professor Falk is author of many other books, uh, ranging from Studies of Bonaventure to philosophical reflections such as uh, Le Combat Amoureux, Dispute Phenomenologique et Theologique. He has been concerned with issues of birth, embodiment, resurrection, ideas of seeing differently, and atheist humanism, whether philosophy is necessarily an atheism, as some have claimed. So today we, we, he will address the concept of Leib and its German and its French rendering as Schar, and the importance for this in the history of phenomenology. So the title of his lecture is The Turn of the Flesh. So without more ado, I, I extend a warm welcome to Professor, Professor Falk to begin our proceedings, who will be assisted by Dr. Nicolas de Ketalara, who will be giving a lecture uh, later today as well. So Professor Falk, over to you. I can't hear you. Right. Okay, so hello everybody. Thanks to Gavin for to have organizing this conference and uh, it would be better to be in Oxford. And uh, I will exactly speak about that point because uh, the question of my lecture is to know what does it mean in French? To be en chair et en os, for, for the people who speak French, the expression en, fer, en chair et en os uh, means to be present or to be here uh, because it is possible to perceive me. So uh, thanks also to Nicolas. Nicolas we will project my text. Uh, I will comment my text and just read uh, some small passages of the text. So uh, this reflection about the question of the flesh and the turn of the flesh uh, is a reflection about the status of the body uh, in phenomenology. And of course, I, I wrote many books about that point, but here it is a very precisely point, which is the question of the translation of the, uh, the German term of Leib, in French and in English, because as you know, uh, uh, we translate Leib in Husserl by chair en français, and it seems that it was translated by body in the English translation of Husserl, but uh, now it is translated by chair, by flesh. Uh, for example, uh, when my first book was translated in English, uh, the translator translated uh, with an English one, he translated uh, share by leaf body. But the editor for Dam University told me, no, you don't have to translate share by leaf body, but you have to translate share by, by flesh. So this question of the translation of, of share, of, of flesh, of lime by share, or by flesh, is not only a question of translation, of traduction. It is a, question, a phenomenological question and a theological question. Why? First, because in the Gospel, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, it is at the beginning of the text, but I, I comment. Uh, perhaps you can, uh, it's, it's not, uh, Nicolas, you can, you can zoom because I think it's not, it's not possible to read. You, you can zoom the text. Okay, it's okay. This you can do it. So at the beginning of my text, 
I quote this situation, look at my hands. No, it's not this one, it's at the beginning. The other one, the fourth link. Look, um, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, I read, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, I have. Uh, in French, un esprit n'a ni chair ni os, comme vous voyez que j'en ai. No flesh, ni flair ni os. But, in you say, you have this expression to be leibhaftic, and leibhaftic is translated in French en chair et en os. So, you can understand, you are not French. I don't know if some French people are present. But if you were French, and if you know Husserl, and if you read the Gospel, you see the same expression, à savoir, to, to say, nobody has flesh, a flesh and bones, as you see, as I have, and to be present, en chair et en os, with flesh and bones. But the question is how to translate my text. And it was a discussion with Nicolas. We did a very good translation to say, do I have to translate en chair et en os en français by in flesh and bones? Or do I have to uh, translate by in flesh and blood? Or do I have to translate it in the flesh? So you see that it's very complicated because I am discussing the translation of Leib in German in French, but I am speaking in English and uh, from an English translation of my text, we're speaking of a translation of the German. So it's absolutely impossible to understand what I'm speaking about, but, but you have to know that this problem was the problem of Merleau-Ponty. It was the problem of Paul Ricoeur. Uh, it was the problem of Michel Henry, and it is the problem of all the phenomenology. So my hypothesis is that there is not only a theological turn of phenomenology, as Janico said, but there is a carnal turn of phenomenology, the turn of the flesh. And if there is a theological turn of phenomenology, I just discovered it now, it is because there was before a phenomenological turn of phenomenology. It means that if Leib was not translated by Cher en français, it would be impossible for Michel Henry, for example, to write a book which is incarnation. Because what did Michel Henry? He superpose, he think the world became flesh, the world became flesh, hein? le verbe s'est fait chair, and the term of flesh, it means share in phenomenology. It means that if you are a French people, you understand that UCL has been translated, live in UCL has been translated by share, and you read in the Gospel of John, et le verbe se fait share, in fact it is sars, and you can think, okay, I understand the share in UCL, which is live, is the same as share in St. John, John, the Gospel of John, which is Sars. It's very complicated, but in fact, if, the, if this uh, homology didn't happen, it would be impossible to speak about a theological incarnation on the way of the phenomenological incarnation. Because as you know, the term of incarnation is not only a theological one, but it was only a theological one before this turn on flesh. It is now a phenomenological one. You can be, you can say with yourself that you have to be incarnate in your body. And when you are speaking, and when you are saying that you have to be incarnate in your body, you are speaking about a phenomenological incarnation. But after the question arises, what does it mean for Christ himself to be incarnate in his body? It means that is Christ a body or is Christ a flesh? Or in my book, which is uh, The Metamorphosis of Finitude and the Reading Peace of the Lamb, I explain that first Christ born as body, but he has to become flesh, the flesh of God. 
as we all have to become our flesh. So this homology between phenological incarnation and theological incarnation raises a question, what does it mean, incarnation? Or there, there is a, a sort of backlash of theology on phenomenology, what I sustain in, in the Crossing the Rubicon, it means that in theology, flesh is not only chair in the meaning of the lived body. Uh, the, the sentence just uh, highlighted by, by Nicholas before, look at my hands and my feet, it is myself. Look at my hand and my feet, it is myself. It means that it is uh, the episode of the gospel with Thomas. I have hands, I have feet, and it is myself, but myself, what does that mean? Does that mean it is myself en chair et en os, in flesh and bones? But what does that mean in flesh and bones? Does it mean in flesh and bones in person, actuality, in my person? It is exactly the, the manner by which we translate Husserl in French. Because when you translate Leibavtik, it is a bit complicated, but very important. When you translate Leibavtik of Husserl in French, you say en chair et en os. But in English, you say in person. So in French, to be in person, you have to be in flesh and bones. But does it mean that you need to have flesh and bones? It's not sure. So this question is the question I want to raise. And now to speak about the turn of the flesh. Um, so just I, I read the, the last paragraph here. The last paragraph you see just before the paragraph. No, just uh, it is therefore on the page two, it is therefore only by interrogating phenomenology that we will put ourselves in a position to understand what is going on in tautology, in theology. Not that phenomenology has no purpose other than clearing up theology, according to a subordination that will make sense here, but rather that the decision made within the framework of phenomenology, including the famous theological uh, the famous translation of the German Leib by the French chair or the English flesh are perhaps not without theological roots, and the word was made flesh, nor theological implication to become incarnate in one's flesh, which is a user expression. So, first point in, in the flesh or in flesh and bones, in, in, dear Nicolas, I don't know how we have to, to translate. Uh, uh, en chair et en os, how do you have to translate it in English? Uh, if you said in the flesh, I'm saying absolutely right, but you, you, you lost the flesh and, and bones. But Nicolas said, if you want, Professor Falks, if you want to speak about the flesh and, board, and bones, you have to speak about the flesh and blood. So it's very complicated. And very interesting because you, if you are speaking about the flesh and blood, it, it, uh, an implicit reference to Christ and to the Eucharist. It's not bones; it is blood. So you can you can think many things about about uh, uh, this point. Um, uh, oh, so I just I see the question. Uh, my I, I wrote a text. I, about this point, I wrote two texts. One text, which is in my book, translated in English, uh, which is uh, the the, uh, the loving struggle. And in this book, the loving struggle, you have a chapter in discussion with Michel Henry. Is there a flesh without body? And I criticized Michel Henry, but I know him very well. He was a good friend of me. But I said, you are speaking about a flesh without body, but we need a body to speak about flesh, and you have a second paper, which is, uh, which is entitled In Flesh and Blood, In Flesh and Bones. And this paper has been, uh, been published in a journal of phenomenology in US. I don't remember the, the, ah, okay, you got it. Ah, thanks, so Nicolas did it. So you have this text, and this text is in my mind, 
the, the sweet of this one in flesh and blood. So first point in the flesh or in flesh and bones. Uh, in fact, this expression, en chair et en os, or in English, in, in German, live aftic, you can find it first in new cell. And when new cell is speaking about the presence of something live aftic, in French, in flesh and bones, it is exactly the same as in English, in person, present in person. But in Martin Heidegger, well, it is in the other article, you have to be perceived to be in flesh and blood and bones. It's very important for the figure of Christ. And for Jean-Paul Sartre, the perception is, is uh, richer than the imagination because when you perceive something, there is a richness in the perception which is not in the imagination. And for Karl Marx, well, it is in the other paper, in the, in the other paper, in Karl Marx, like Aftik, it is to be in relationships with the root and even in person. So what I want to say, I just want to say that this expression, Leib Aftik, which is coming from Leib, and the expression en en os in French, in Sartre, for example, or in Bergson, this expression raised the question of what does it mean to be in flesh? To be in flesh, does it mean to be in person or to, or to be with flesh? And it is absolutely not the same. And you can read the, the story of the episode of the resurrection of Christ in the two ways. You can say that yes, Christ resurrected in person because when he's in front of Thomas, the apostle Thomas, he said, it is me. You recognize me by my hands and my feet. So it is a person, it is me in person. But you can say also, exactly as the Caravage show it, I don't know if you know the, the, the painting of the Caravage, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the Thomas uh, seeing the, the painting of the Christ resurrected, and said, it is with flesh and bones. So this question is an important one for phenomenology and for theology. Why? Because in my mind, there So you can hear me? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because some, so someone said, told me my connection is not good. So, um, so uh, it is a question for phenomenology and a question for theology too. For phenomenology, why? Because in, in my opinion, my mind, there is a sort of idealism of phenomenology. And this idealism of phenomenology is coming from the translation of Leib by flesh and the primacy of the flesh on the body, le prima de la chair sur le corps. And what does that mean, the primacy of the flesh on the body? It is the primacy of the lived experience on the organic body. And here is the turn. We will see it in the translation of flesh between uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche and Merlop and, and, and Yussel, because when the French people is translating Nietzsche, listen to me, when the French people is translating Nietzsche, he is always translating Leib by body. But when the French people is translating Yussel, since Merleau-Ponty, Ricoeur, and Michel Henry and the others, but not since Levinas, because Levinas, I will show it, didn't translate Leib by flesh. He translated by organic body in the Cartesian meditation. And that is the point, absolutely, absolutely incredible. So when French people translate Yussel, he said flesh, chair, which means lived experience. So the primacy of the flesh on the body is the primacy of the lived experience on the organic body. But what about the body? Is there a flesh without body? So it is uh, an issue for 
théologie, pour théologienne, une théologie de celle. Mais c'est une issue pour euh, phénoménologie tout. Why? Because there is uh, the combat, the, the struggle between, uh, against the Gnosticism at the beginning of Christianity, everyone knows that, and gave in, of course. And in, in this debate, you have uh, um, Irenaeus, who is writing his adversus aereses against the Docetism, and you have um, uh, Tertullian, who wrote uh, De Carne Christi against the, the Gnosticism. And in Tertullian and Irenaeus, and I show that in my book, which is God, Flesh, and the Other, which is translated in English. You have a chapter on Tertullian and a chapter on Irenaeus to show that to have a flesh at the beginning of Christianity, it is to have a true flesh. And for Tertullian, Christ is Christ because he, he assumed our flesh with hair uh, like us, uh, uh, flesh like us, born like us, Why, why not? He was a human being and not an angel against a Christos Angelos. So you see that this question, which is to know, how do we have to translate Leib, is a question for phenomenology and for theology. And when I came to Germany, the first time I go to the mass and the priestess told me the Leib Christi, Leib Christi. So what, 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 what are you eating? And in French, you said le corps du Christ and not la chair du Christ. And in English, the body of Christ. So what are you eating? Are you eating body or flesh? Or my interpretation in this text is to say that the question, the physical question for today, It's not only the distinction between body and flesh, and we are always speaking about body and flesh, corpore and leib, but the question of the translation of leib. It's not the same. The translation of leib is leib, the organic body. In fact, it is in that way that Levinas translated in 1931 the Cartesian meditation in the paragraph 44. Or is it, to the second point, The translation of Lyme, uh, is it chair, which is in that case not organic body, but lived experience. So it is the, the, the turn of the flesh. So I read the text from the from point, page four, from the, longest, from the linguistical root to the philosophical problem. Okay, we are. Here we are. It's okay? I read the text. The translation of Leib is probably a cross, even a crux phenologica, belonging to the whole phenological tradition, or at least the French tradition. But this phenological cross, if originates in language, probably also crucifies adeptly and implicitly the body in its materiality, corpore, so as to glorify the flesh in its expressivity, Leib, all the more. In defense of the primacy of the flesh in phenomenology, denoting here the lived experience of the body, one will certainly first all mention that the word live in German, precisely translated as chair or flesh in French, according to a convention that I think must still be questioned now, come from Leben, living, 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 and from Bleiben, staying, being in the flesh, or rather in flesh and blood, or in flesh and bones, I don't know, but it is blood in English, like I think, is therefore, first of all, and almost exclusively undergoing oneself as living being. Or, that which takes precedence is matters more than being said to be objectively, uh, is, is, excuse me, is less life itself than another way of being, in the sense of that subjectivity experiences oneself as living matter more than being said to be objectively and almost biologically alive. In virtually the wall of phenomenology, contrary to Nietzsche, for example, life is made up less of flesh and blood, that of strata of lived experience, so that the undergoing of the ego Ish, almost always takes precedence over the throbbing of the greed, self, zest. 
In addition, one also noted that in the most common German usage, lives designates the belly of upper body. Nichts im Leib haben, have nothing in one stomach. Gesegneten Leib sein, being pregnant. Der Mutter Leib, the womb, etc. More generally, in the German language, language, Leib correspond to all that concerns the most vital corporally intimacy, Arten Leib haben, being constipated, Am ganzen Leib zittern, shaking with one's whole body. Even better, Leib sometimes designates If not analogically, then at least metaphorically, what is most spiritual in the human being, as who has hurt against who does not, can erst in Leib haben, being hurtless, mit Leib und Seele, wohl as er soll jemand mit Leib und Seele ergeben sein, loving someone with all my heart. In short. At least in the Germanist origin, life just seems to concern the subject rather than the object, the interior ego rather than the exterior self. Life is what is undergone, subjectively felt, rather than objectively observed and recorded. Incarnation, Verleiblichung, not Verkörperung, is or would then be the act of always already being further embodied in one's own body, whereas incorporation, verkörperung, instead concerns taking up an almost functional place within a body without experiencing it as such. This work, all the better, theologically this time, but here it is philosophically, as I developed myself in the metamorphosis of finitude, which is coming from the body to the flesh, and taking the same path in the opposite but not the concrete direction, the winning face of the lamp, because in the, in the metamorphosis of finitude, I'm going from the flesh to the body because it is a question of resurrection. But in the winning face of the lamp, I'm going from the, from the, no, I'm going from the body to the flesh in metamorphosis of finitude. I'm going from the flesh to the body in the Eucharist because this is my body. And I'm not sure that when you say this is my body, he said to you, this is a, an experience, a lived experience. But then it depends on your tradition. It depends on your confession. But what does that mean? The real experience of the body. L'experience real. La présence. What does it mean? The real presence of the body. Uh, if you are Catholic, it's very complicated because you are thinking that there is something which is material, but it is impossible to thinking. So you can say, no, no, it is not body. It is only life. Okay, if it is only life, it is a, 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 a personal experience. So you see that this question of the translation of life and body and sars and soma is a, a question for phenomenology and theology too. And we have to think what is, what, what is the meaning of the turn of the flesh to understand what does it mean, the turn uh, of phenomenology, uh, the theological turn of phenomenology. So, um, one must, I continue, uh, one must become flesh, vir leib, and this is what French phenomenologists, especially Smirno Ponty, have remembered for the famous Paragraph four, uh, uh, 36 of Husserl's Ideas 2 on the reversibility of the touching and being touched. I don't know if you all know what's happened in that, uh, in that text. In fact, uh, Merleau-Ponty came to Louvain and he read the manuscript of Husserl and he discovered this paragraph of Idean 2, Phenology for Constitution, the, the Touching, the touching touch, and the interpretation is of is what does it mean when I touch, when my uh, right hand is touching my left hand? First, I feel. Second point, I feel what I feel. Third point, I feel that you feel if I shake your hand, but I don't feel what you are feeling. It is the enigma of the fourth term. What does it mean? L'énigme du quatrième terme. I feel, I feel as I feel, I feel that you feel, but I don't feel what you feel. And it is because I, I can't feel what you are feeling 
that I need, as it is in the Reading Feast of the Lord, that I need to speak exactly in the erotic relation, in the erotic relation, you feel, you feel that you feel, you feel that she feels or that he feels, but you don't feel what he feels or what she feels. So you need to speak what you feel. That's why you need flesh and word. The word became flesh, and we can speak a long time about that point. So, but I read, I read Merleau-Ponty. Um, uh, no, uh, no, it is, it is not Merleau-Ponty. It is Husserl. But Merleau-Ponty is reading that, this passage. If I speak of physical thing, left hand, then I am abstracting for this sensation. A ball of ling has nothing like etc. If I do include them, then it is not that the physical thing is now richer, but it still it becomes body. But Nicholas, it is the English translation. And in French, elle devient chair. <laughs> no, uh, uh, so you, what I see, you can't see it because you're English. <laughs> because you can't see it because me. When I read the translation of Husserl, because of, of, of the usage of the, uh, of the translation given by Merleau-Ponty and Ricoeur, we always say, elle devient chair, elle uh, 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 live, we translate, elle devient chair, the sensation become chair. But I see that in English, because it is the English translation, becomes body. But now, uh, as you know it, when you translate Merleau-Ponty in English, you translate chair by flesh. When you translate uh, Michel Henry, you translate chair by flesh. And when you translate my book, Falk, you translate chair by flesh. But in fact, flesh is not absolutely, it's absolutely not in English a lived experience. It is meat. It is, it is so, so. But in French, too, because flesh, it is that. So the question, why have we translated this lived experience by uh, lived body? Alors, the question is that, in fact, it is uh, the, the impossible reduction of the body, is that, in fact, uh, it is also a paper I wrote, which is the impossible reduction of the body, but I don't think it is translated in English. It is in the Castelli Colloquium conference. Uh, in fact, um, Husserl himself uh, never said that Leib is only a live body. It means that the reading of Husserl by Merleau-Ponty and Ricoeur is probably, probably not what Husserl wanted to say. Uh, why? First, because uh, in his... Um, uh, in, in, in his study for the IDN2, IDS2, in fact, he's speaking about the thing body, hein? that das ding leib, la chose corps propre, la chose chair, das ding leib. It means that leib, chair or body, I don't know, is a ding. And if it is a ding, you know the distinction made by yourself between, between the ding and, 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 and the zare. Surul Sudan Zaram Zebs, and Surul Sudan Zaram Zebs, the retour aux choses même. It is, it is not the, the, the coming back to, to the thing, to the thing. It is the coming back to the experience of, have, of the thing. So it is Surul Sudan Zaram Zebs, Surul Sudan Zaram Zebs. Surul to the uh, come, voilà, in English, uh, come, back to, come back to the lived experience. And not only to the thing, the, the thing itself. But here in this text, you can see that he's speaking about das ding leib. It means that for Husserl himself, it's not so clear that we can reduce the flesh or reduce the body to speak about the flesh. In that way, um, can we follow Merleau-Ponty in his? Hypothesis of the inversion of the phantom limb. And uh, I remember uh, I gave a course on that point of those pages on Merleau-Ponty. And then I said, 
It's completely wrong, but I, I, I always thought it was right before. What Berleau-Ponty is speaking about? He is speaking about someone who is on puce, so he has no more arm, no more leg, and he said, uh, he, he analyzed that it is possible to feel something I don't have anymore. So I can feel this part of my heart, which is cut, which is cut, or this part of my leg. I read the consciousness, oh, this is the, the, the quotation, the consciousness of phantom limb remains then itself unclear. The, the input feels their leg in the same way as I feel, um, as I feel currently the existence of a friend who is nevertheless not before my eyes. So, in flesh, you see that in flesh and bones, in not to have flesh and bones, not to have flesh and not to have bones as, as a friend. Not in my eyes. They have no loss to it because they continue to allow for it, what is right. Huh? The phantom arm is not a representation of the arm, but the ambivalent presence of an arm. To have a phantom arm is to remain open to all the action of which the arm alone is capable. It is to retain the practical feel which one enjoyed before mutilation. Okay, so I can feel something I don't have. But my hypothesis is absolutely the inverse. Because if I need body to have flesh, the question is not to feel something that I have, but, uh, no, it's not to feel something that I don't have, but to not feel something that I have. You understand? <laughs> so it is the inverse. It means that the question, my question is not the question of the phantom lib, but it is, for example, the question of anesthesia or a tumor. For example, where you are going to the dentist, after you are anesthesia, and you feel something in your mouth, you have it, but you can't feel it in anesthesia. So, so in that case, you don't, your experience of body is not your live body, but something you don't have. I read the end of my paragraph uh, here, according to my hypothesis, I think you can find it, According to my yes, you it. According to my hypothesis of a return to one the body, it is not or not longer the limb that I do not have that I feel that matters, the example of the legless of amputus, but the limb that I have and do not and no longer feel, the example of noobness, local anesthesia, the slow one of an cancerous limb. There is indeed much more and more existential than being the body one does not have, the phantom lib, namely not being the body that one does have, bodily numbness or illness. Okay. So, the question is, what is body? Then we come to this question of translation, and I will read the text, Point six, page eight, the question of translation. The immense detour made here. First, returning to the phrase in the flesh, Leibhaftig, we did it. Second point, rooting Leib in the German language, we did it. Third point, the impossible reduction of the body, we did it. And first point, fourth point, the inversion of the phantom Leib leads us, or rather leads us back, logically speaking, to the phenomenological cross of Leib's French translation. There is actually no reason to sacrifice the body, corpus, on the altar of the flesh, Leib, with a simple wave on the, of the end. And nothing prevents us either from thinking this cross of phenomenology, Leib corpus, as being a soul, and in some way to cross of theology um, itself, the corporality is crucified. If Francis Bacon is a religious painter only in butcher's sauce, well, he, he said that the, vrai, the, the true crucifixion are in the butcheries, uh, 
because Christ is also meat on the cross. Uh, you can be shocked by that, by that. But there is a sort of animality of Christ, which is not bestiality, and you can read it in the reading feast of the Lamb. Okay. Um, flesh, so in, in the word flesh in German, namely the meat of which we are also constituted. There is certainly the body that gives itself as flesh. In the road of the Sorteillon, for example, Sir Lee was the son of the God. But there is also the flesh reduced to the body, the source of the cry. And when Jesus had cried, again, the Lord voice, um, and the Lord voice were given as the spirit. It is by holding to the two dimensions of the flesh, what consciousness lives in theological sense, you say, has the common meaning of meat, the loss, that we will avoid failing into either the idealism of phenology or in fascination with materiality. So it is the same in English as in French. Huh? When you say flesh, it can be the live body, but it can be my flesh here. It is flesh and not bones. Okay, then it then falls precisely to Levinas, of course, independently of Christian interpretation to make us that the translation of life by chair or flesh and corpor by corps or body does not work and is the very least not obvious. Even better, as I will show, we can point out and indeed must do so that before the turn of the flesh is definitely taken the instigation of Ricoeur and Merleau-Ponty, and followed by wall, the wall of French phrenology, and in particular, Leib had always been translated into French as well as English by core or body rather than chair or flesh. Or what's happened? What's happened? Such is, for example, the traditional translation of Nietzsche. When it is a question of corporality in the philosophy of Maria, the human being is guided by the common thread of the body rather than flesh, or again, it is a body that philosophizes, their lab philosophy, but it's body and other. So in, in Merleau-Ponty, it is always translated by uh, flesh, is, lab is translated by body in niche, but it will be translated by uh, flesh, by not Levinas, but Ricoeur and Merleau-Ponty. In short, Construing the life on the basis of what is lived in consciousness rather than of organicity, on the, of the manner rather than the matter, is entirely without warrant as soon as the use of the translation, in this, for example, and the ordinary use of language, having nothing in one's stomach, and at least uncovers the difficulty. It must then, at the very least, be questioned where does the greater taken by the philosopher of the flesh, led by Merleau-Ponty and Ricoeur, come from given by Emmanuel Levinas, did not make the turn nor even thought of doing so when translating Husserl Cartesian meditation in 1931, shortly after they had been delivered in 1929. So you know that Husserl have been, have been invited by Merleau-Ponty in Sorbonne. In, in, 19, uh, in 1929, and immediately Levinas, when we were invited to uh, Husserl, uh, translated. And the Cartesian meditation, the text of, of, um, of uh, Levinas, is the text used by Merleau-Ponty, Ricoeur, and so on. Excuse me. Uh, yes. You see it? Cartesian meditation. You see it or not? Oh, Cartesian meditation. I'm not sure you see something. Ah, yes. So, and if I open my text at the paragraph uh, 20, uh, 44, page 80, in the French edition, you have to know that everybody uh, uh, every the French philosopher worked on that text, and I read what I read. I read the translation of Levinas at the end of the page nine, the story of the flesh. Among the bodies, yes, we are. Among the bodies, corpor, les corps, 
Belonging to this nature and included in my peculiar ownness, réduite à ce qui m'appartient, I, I then find my animate organism. Bah, animate of me, uh, I, I beat the, the, I put flesh, I put chair. Because Merleau-Ponty is saying chair, Ricoeur is saying chair, but you are really, we are reading, animate organism of my own organic body. In English, it, it seems that it is always body, hein, Nicolas. <laughs> it's not flesh, it is body. <laughs> voilà. Find the ish, mind and life, mon corps propre organique, namely, as the only of them, that is not just a body, but precisely an animate organic. So if we look at it from up close and nearly at the century distance, Levinas' translation of this passage from Husserl is not only giving us the French something to smile about today, but also leads us coy, coy and dumbfounded. All the more, so as it will serve, or we have served, as the official French translation for more than six decades published by Vrin in 1931, waiting for the other edition in 1994, be printed many times, nevertheless without being contested. At tout instance, it translates Leib, Levinas, as organic body, alors Kern translate animate organism, French man Leib, rather than as flesh or almost body, which was the meaning of corporal life in Husserl, not just from what is lived, but also from what is biological, normally in terms of undergoing of the self, but also in terms of the flux of, wha of what is organic within ourselves. Speaking a posteriori, Levinas translates Husserl based on the Hollandais commonly used, and as it seems from Nietzsche, as I said, they're like philosophers, the body, the flesh, philosophers. But does Levinas blunder here? Do he make a mistake as those that follow a ledge? If the subsequent French translation by Marc Delaunay dates from 1994, does that mean that for 60 years, all French readers of Husserl were mistaken? to the point of necessarily and personally crossing out the phrase organic body or animate organic, you have to do the work in English, uh, animate organic, in each of their copies and replacing with flesh. Nevertheless, Levinas insists, not to say insists repeatedly, knowing how much it is matter to him and he appears to him alone when one looks at subsequent French phenomenology on the materiality of the body, existence and existence, as a signification of the biological need enjoyment in totality and infinity. Hence, the following note by the translator in 1931 edition, inserted at the bottom of the page containing the relevant passage, I've got it here, uh, the one passage in, in the paragraph 44 of the Cartesian meditation demonstrates that the present translation is intentional and always nothing to chance. I quote Levinas, the German term corpor and Leib, having only one single French, English equivalent, namely body, are here translated as body and organic body. Hello. In fact, I, I wait, uh, I saw it uh, six years ago. It means that I beef my, my, my text on the book to put chair, but in fact, it is organic body. So what happened? Uh, I, in five minutes, I finish. Huh? I have to finish uh, in five minutes, I, I know. In five minutes, I, I try to just to, 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 to finish, to, to explain the, the end of the interpretation. So what is the end of my interpretation? It is the fact that something changed with Paul Ricoeur and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And in fact, Husserl has been read uh, uh, by the way of Ricoeur and Merleau-Ponty. And that's why in French, in French, we are always speaking about share. And we completely forget the body and the organic body, which is a true question for theology. 
because if you suppress the organic body in the figure of Christ, you are you are you are you are falling in Gnosticism. That's why perhaps as I explain it or as I show it in my, my in my text in, in the Love in Struggle about uh, Michel Henry, is there a flesh of uh, without body? I think there is a, a part of Gnosticism in the reading of, of Michel Henry's uh, St. John's Gospel because precisely of the turn of the flesh. In fact, before the theological turn of phenomenology develops by Janico, there is a carnal turn of phenomenology implicitly made by Ricoeur and Merleau-Ponty. So the question of interpretation, the transformation of flesh translated in French by organic body by Cher is doing by Ricoeur in his book in French à l'école de la phénoménologie at school of phenomenology but uh, it, it seems that in English as Nicolas said it is an analysis of his phenomenology but the text the French text of Ricoeur was first a text published in a journal and the, the title of his text was Pour lire la cinquième méditation cartésienne de Husserl. For reading the fifth Cartesian meditation of Husserl. So it was, it was a guide of reading. And me, I read that text first. And then he put it in his book à l'école de la phénoménologie, at school of phenomenology. But it seems that when the book has been, has been uh, translated in English, uh, Nicolas told me, in fact, Ricoeur changed the term for the English people can understand what he's speaking about. And it seems that he put the term of body where, where in French it was the term of flesh. <laughs> it's very complicated. But what said Ricoeur? I could, uh, I could just a quotation. So, so first analysis of energy and well self another between brackets you can find that find that uh, page page 11 page 11 not before before page 11 just the first paragraph between brackets uh, yes so i quote Ricoeur. between brackets i quote the french translation by levinas and pfeiffer organic body Taking the liberty of modifying it. Ah, <laughs> voilà. It is the liberty of Ricoeur. What is the freedom of Ricoeur? His liberty is freedom. His freedom is to change the translation because he's thinking that the translation by Levinas is not the good one because Levinas sought the lib in Husserl as a sort of organic body and he didn't understand the distinction between Live and corpore, it means flesh and body. But in fact, when you are reading Levinas, as I told, as when I said, uh, when you are reading Levinas, for Levinas, the body is not first a lived body. The body it is a true body. For example, if you are reading the existence of the materiality of the body. Merleau-Ponty is doing absolutely the same. In fact, just before Levinas, where in the Phenomenology of Perception, published in 1945, because he distinguished in the first chapter between the body as object of mechanist physiology and the spatiality of one's own body. Or he distinguished between the synthesis of one's own body and the, and the rest. But in fact, the distinction between Flesh, no, the, the translation of Leib by flesh, by chair, in, in, uh, in Merleau-Ponty is not absolutely clear in the phenology of perception, but it becomes clear in his text of 19, uh, published in 1951, uh, Man and Adversity. And I quote the text. Or the end of the text, or the, so, or just the end, for many thinkers, at the end, for many thinkers, at the close of the 19th century, the body was a bit of matter, a network of mechanism. The 20th century arrested 
and dependent, the notion of flesh that is animate body. Alors, here, in the English translation of body, it is flesh. <laughs> the translation of Lucien was body, in English, and the translation of Merleau-Ponty is flesh. Why? Because Merleau-Ponty and Ricoeur took that flesh is wrong. So I finish just to say that uh, Ricoeur, alors, just to say that uh, Ricoeur uh, was absolutely uh, uh, conscient, uh, conscient of this uh, transformation, huh? uh, but in fact, Ricoeur, at the end of his life, it is page 13, I will finish, I finish, at the end of his life, in his book, One Self as Another, Soi-même comme un autre, book published in 1990. Uh, you have to understand that Levinas translated the Cartesian Mediation in 1931. Then Merleau-Ponty changed it a bit, the question of flesh in 1930. 43 with the phenology of perception. Then Merleau-Ponty changing uh, definitively with, with his text uh, about adversity. And then Ricoeur changing definitively in his text uh, at the School of Phenomenology about uh, the fifth Cartesian meditation. And wh wh what he's saying at the end of his life, he said, it's not so easy. He said, in fact, perhaps I was wrong. I read these texts. Uh, uh, the one who, who saw that, it is uh, Richard Kearney in his carnal hermeneutics. He, he saw this point, and I spoke with him. I've been many times to Boston, and, and I spoke with him about that point. But I think he's right. So at the end of uh, the page 13, I, wrote, I quote his Ricoeur in one self as another. Only as the ontology of the flesh breaks free as far as possible from the problematic of constitution, that paradoxically required it, required it can we face the inverse paradox. Namely, know what it means that a body is my body, that is flesh, but that the flesh is also a body among bodies. This Ricoeur who is speaking, the old Ricoeur. It is here that phenomenology finds its limits. And all my work is coming from that point. At least a phenomenology that intends to, der to derive the objective aspect of the world from a non-objective and primordial experience, principally by means of intersubjectivity. It is because you sell suit of the other than me only as another me, and never the self as another, that he has no answer, the paradox soon by up in this question, how am I to understand that my flesh is also a body? And Husserl, I, I finish, Husserl, in one of his manuscripts, said, um, um, <coughs> uh, Alors, euh, le corps, euh, it, is more, uh, it is more difficult to know the body than the flesh. And me, I explain that as Descartes said, euh, euh, l'âme est plus aisée à connaître que le corps, the soul is easier to know than body, Descartes. Et but we can say in phenology that the flesh, l'âme, is easier to know than the body. Corpeur. But the question today is a question of corpus or of something which is between the late body, you say, a certain interpretation of self, and the extended body, Descartes, and myself, I create a concept. En français, le corps épandu, hein, éthique du corps épandu, uh, it has been translated in English, the spirit body. And what is a spirit body? It is in the reading piece of the lamb. It is in a book uh, I wrote, which is uh, Ethique du corps répandu. The spirit body is something which is between the extended body of Descartes and the leaf body of Husserl. What does that mean? That means that we are biological body. Even Christ is a biological body. We are a biological body. 
but the other seeing my body can learn to me that I am also a live body. Exactly what the centurion said to the Christ, this one is truly the son of, the son of God. It means that it is the other seeing my body which can uh, show me that my body is not only a corpus or an organic body. That's why I am first an animal, but not only an animal, but to be an animal is never to be bestial. Thanks.